for coming and uh, it's a beautiful evening out there. So I don't blame you if you're not here, uh, but as Ma Amanda said, it's going to be recorded and uh, I, I believe it'll be available on the KWMR website. I'll figure it out. Yeah. And so before I start, I just wanted to let you know that this isn't a traditional history talk like you might have seen me do. This is more like a come into my living room for a slideshow, which is what we used to do all the time, show slides. And um, because this is, a, this is a personal view of, of my uh, involvement with the fire, both with my family and then my work. So, um, so I'm not going to tell you a whole lot of facts and this and that. And uh, I'm going to just give you um, uh, what I hope will be an enjoyable show. So let me get to the share screen and make it big. And I'm assuming you can all see that. And uh, so here we go. Um, this is a, a little behind the scenes view. And it's interesting uh, that you might find this picture odd because this is not the Mount Vision fire, but this has a lot to do with um, my experience with it. Uh, I worked for the National Park Service for 10 years here at Point Reyes, a little bit of time there at Golden Gate. Uh, and during that time, I also did a whole lot of work in the Western region, which is around parks all over the West, got to go to Hawaii and Kalapapa and places all over Arizona and California and saw a lot of national parks and, and did, a, did a lot of work. And so there were times that I traveled uh, and came back uh, pretty tired. And I had a lot of re responsibilities at the park. I was a historical technician acting as the park uh, historian. And um, it uh, was a really interesting job, but there came times when I really needed a break. And on October 3rd in 1995, I had starting my first day off of a hoped for two week vacation. And I took the little boat that we had, a little family boat up to a favorite place up at Fruit Tree Beach. And by myself, the kids were in school, Carrie was away. And uh, I sat there on the beach going, oh, I'm so tired, I'm so glad I have this time off. Well, after a little while, I looked up on Inverness Ridge. And by the way, this picture isn't that day, but it's very similar, because here you can't see the ridge. But I looked at the ridge and I saw a little puff of smoke going up right from the top of Mount Vision. And uh, I thought, oh, little fire, hmm. Sat there a little while longer and the fire got bigger, the puff of smoke enlarged and enlarged. And I looked up and said, that's fires moving. I started to think about relatives. Um, my parents-in-law were up on the slopes of Mount Vision, my aunt Louise, my brother down below, my mother in Sea Haven, uh, who might, might have been out of danger, but I suddenly realized uh, maybe, uh, maybe I shouldn't be lolling on the beach. And then it struck me that, wait a sec, that's in the park and I work for the park. There goes my vacation. So I ran home in the boat. And when I got home, this is what it looked like. You can see how I've pulled the boat in in front of the house. We lived at the edge of the Janazi Ranch at the south end of Point Ray Station. And we ended up having a front row seat to the fire uh, as far as the family was concerned. Um, it took off quite a bit that day and uh, it became quite a, a big big deal for people around here. Now, of course, the people whose houses were up on the ridge uh, had a lot to worry about, as, as you'll see. Um, and that, but then everybody around, we'd never really seen a fire like this. Um, the fires we're seeing today all over the Northern California area and all that smoke we saw, um, that, that hadn't been happening at all. And so this, this fire, everybody came out and looked, um, a favorite place to watch was the uh, Martinelli property, the um, Tamales Bay Trail just north of Point Ray Station had a really good vantage point. And so people uh, came out to look in, in, in horror as things exploded and you just watched the fire grow and grow and grow with these dramatic scenes. Uh, and it was 
yeah, it, it was it was quite horrifying. That night was especially disturbing because um, houses were burning up on Inverness Ridge up in Paradise Ranch Estates um, during the day and, into, and, and overnight we could hear uh, propane tanks exploding. You could see sudden uh, uh, flare ups that you knew was likely a, a home, somebody's home. Um, didn't get much sleep that, that night. And uh, I don't know if the kids did either, but this is a nighttime view uh, showing the flames uh, devouring that area up at the top of the ridge. And when we got up in the morning, this is what it looked like. There'd been a lot of destruction already. And this is the day, this is the fourth, it was a Wednesday, when the fire really took off and headed down towards the coast. It had been doing its dirty deeds up in the neighborhoods, but now it headed into the park and uh, uh, expanded something like 8,000 acres just in one day, rushing down uh, through all of that uh, coyote brush and bishop pine trees down to the coastline. Uh, so we watched it move into the area above Inverness Park, um, like you can see here, and just not knowing what was gonna happen, where, where it was gonna go. This is a, uh, in our backyard, that was our landlords uh, and neighbors, the Gillardis, uh, watching because this day on Wednesday, a lot of air power came in, helicopters and planes. And we got to watch that quite firsthand because on the Genazi Ranch was a pond that was nicely adjacent to the fire. So helicopters started coming in with their buckets and picking up water right out of the ranch pond. Now this was especially exciting for our three kids, uh, Molly, Nora, and Ben you see there, uh, because wow, a helicopter coming down and all the excitement of the fire and the worry uh, about what was going on. We knew it wasn't gonna come down to our house, we didn't think, but it was, it was a scary time and an also an exciting time. And I was here alone with the kids for the first few days. Ben really got ready to defend the house, uh, got his whole fire set up, and uh, we felt very secure because of that. But that second day, the smoke got really bad, second and third days, and you started seeing these scenes, which are very similar to what we were seeing with the Woodward fire not that long ago, the sun coming through, uh, sunsets that were barely sunsets. This is from up on Olima Hill. Uh, the levee road being closed off. See, this is all fairly familiar to us, but remember that 25 years ago, this was uh, something new and something really big. And the evening just settled in with smoke all over the place. And, and it was a bad time because we knew that um, by that time that about 45 houses had been destroyed and now the fire was ravaging the park. Uh, these are some of the houses up in Paradise Ranch Estates, beautiful places that um, didn't make it. And we knew people up there and uh, uh, just a, a very um, upsetting time and terrible time. So just to jump to the current day right now, before I go back into the past, the Woodward fire, like I said, was very different in that there were other fires going on in the area, bringing smoke, uh, bringing these awful eerie scenes. This is up where we are looking at the uh, sunrise. Uh, and our fire, Woodward fire wasn't as big and it did threaten homes, we were all ready to leave, but we're really fortunate that it didn't take off into the Bishop Pine Forest to the north where it really would have done some terrible damage. This is a scene that I enjoyed in Nicasio, probably a lot of you passed by. Uh, somebody said it was George Lucas's uh, robots heading back to Skywalker Ranch, but it's, it's the buckets and with those tree companies, the, but in the dense smoke. Now, the Vision Fire, 
took place through a couple of weeks in October of 1995. And here's our little view of, uh, you can get yourself oriented with Point Ray Station in Inverness, the Bear Valley area down in the right and Drake Sestero. Well, the Vision Fire was pretty big. It was over 12,000 acres, almost 13,000 acres, um, burned as we know from the ridge right down to the coast. Uh, caused a lot of damage. You can see in the upper right, you can see where there's homes now that have been rebuilt, but it, it burned into the neighborhoods above Inverness Park and Tomales Bay. The Woodward fire was less than half the size. And so the comparison is interesting to see. And, and they also overlapped, as you can see, quite a bit of land was burned, uh, reburned by the Woodward fire as it came through. The park put out a number of good bulletins, um, and you'll see some of those a little later, but the, of keeping us apprised of what was happening. Um, I hadn't gone back to work yet. I had the kids to deal with and this and that, but how uh, the darkest part here is the first bit of fire that or originated at the top of Inverness Ridge on Mount Vision uh, due to a illegal campfire that hadn't been put out properly. And you can see the first day, which is the darkest, went right over and burned down onto the east side of Inverness Ridge, burning the houses. Uh, the second day, which is the darker gray, um, uh, moved a little, little farther in the morning. And then that afternoon went way down to the coast uh, that afternoon and the next day. And by that time, within two days, 11,000 acres had burned, which was most of the, the fire area. Um, and so the part on the right, is where the fire basically slowed down because it hit D Douglas fir trees, forests, and, um, and that burns much more slowly there. And we were fortunate with the Woodward fire that it was burning in that area uh, and didn't get into the, as much into the um, Bishop Pines, didn't get into them at all, or down uh, the brushy slopes towards the coast. Uh, just the other day, we drove to Lumentor and saw a flare up. This was Thursday evening. Uh, but well, the reason I show this picture is you can see in the far distance on the right, you can see some of the woodward burn. This was a flare up where the smoke is coming up. But all this area in the foreground was burned in the 1995 Vision Fire. And it's come back really well. And in fact, you can even see that the Bishop Pines that are regrowing, that a number of them are dying. There are, are reasons for that. Um, but one thing is that they came back very densely and uh, just their natural thinning out is one of the processes, but I understand there are some diseases and, and drought and this and that that are also affecting that. Um, but the area came back pretty well and it, it was always pretty scary to see this fire happen again and the worry that it could be as bad as the vision fire and we're really fortunate that that didn't happen. Uh, this is that flare up from Limantour Beach just on Thursday night. Okay, so this guy, is me 25 years ago, because within uh, four days or so, I was called back to work and to join the BEAR team, which is the Burned Area Emergency Rehabilitation Group, which is a number of experts from all around the country. They put one together for the Woodward Fire too, although it was a little more brief. Um, uh, experts in various fields to deal with the aftermath of the fire. Um, the publicity said that I was one of the first people in after the fire, and that's the, a bunch of people came in. I was part of a big group, and our, our task was to, depending on our discipline, go in and, and figure out, well, what's next? How can we help heal this? How can we deal with things like erosion, uh, wildlife impacts, uh, vegetation, this and that, and to make sure that things uh, come back well. You don't want a lot of uh, invasive plants to come back. You don't want floods and landslides. And my job was to uh, work with the bear team in cultural resources, looking at historic and archaeological sites in the burn area to assess their damage and also to maybe cover them up because uh, archaeological sites were laid bare and and the last thing that um, federal government wants is for you to go in and start poking around. So we spent a fair amount of time uh, hiding <laughs> places. Since I'd worked for the park and been in the area for a long time, I was the resource for 
where everything was that was historic. And so uh, I started working with the cultural bear team. It was one guy from the bear group who was from outside. His name was Paul Gleason and with Lanny Panola that you'll see in a little bit. Uh, just like at the Woodward fire, they set up a fire camp at the Bear Valley Visitor Center. Uh, it was quite a scene uh, where they could feed hundreds of people, lots of trucks, many different agencies working. Uh, Superintendent Don Neubacher put together um, uh, teams of people from the Park Service, uh, but there we had, we had a lot of uh, different agencies working here. Uh, and so the places like the picnic grounds were transformed into this little city to take care of the firefighters who were here sleeping in tents, uh, places to get food and, and and anything you needed pretty much was was there. This side picture I think was taken a little later after a lot of it had cleared out, but you can see tents and remember we got to see this at the San Geronimo uh, former golf, golf course. Uh, with the Woodward fire. So my little group, uh, Lanny, Paul and I went, had a truck and we went up into the fire zone and were able to follow the fire trucks basically or get in their way. I don't think that's what we were doing here. Um, at the period of time when the fire was still burning down in the Douglas fir forest down the Sky Trail uh, over towards the Woodward Valley Trail, et cetera, the, the south side of Mount Wittenberg. Um, we saw a lot of dramatic scenes and uh, you know, disheartening. It's a, it's a place we've always loved and hiked and, and here a lot of it was burned, but you can see that so many trees survived and, a lot, and, and just like with the, you've been hearing about with the Woodward fire, things uh, uh, were, it was spotty. Sometimes it was an intense fire and sometimes it wasn't. And of course, fire in general is good, but um, a lot of heavy equipment up there, a lot of just burned, burned land, not so lovely at the moment, uh, still smoking. But this, this you can see, this is in the Doug Fir Forest up on the ridge uh, by the lower part of the Sky Trail. And you can see that it just burned in the underbrush. It burned fairly slow and uh, wasn't uh, 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 a threat type of problem. It was more of a mopping up and containing operation. And so Lanny and I spent a lot of time in here looking around we went all over the park. This is the area near Muddy Hollow. This is Glenbrook, where you can see the fire made kind of a mosaic around. And even within weeks later, there were still smoking stumps and places that uh, uh, were, were still hot, but the, people were keeping an eye on them, but there weren't trucks around or anything like that. But a whole lot of the park was just devastated. These, these, these blackened landscapes. And it uh, uh, was just, um, well, it was just quite an experience to see. Um, they didn't open the park for a couple of months, as I recall. And so by then, even some green was starting to come up. But this was, this was fresh, smoky, blackened land. This is the area around the Laguna Ranch, the hostel, and the environmental center. And you can see that it spared trees, especially down in the riparian areas, but not always. We saw groves of alder trees that in, in, in riparian areas that were completely burned. So it just kind of depended on the intensity of the fire at the time. Now we were looking for cultural sites and we knew that there'd be a number that we didn't know about that would show up. Uh, we didn't find too many of those, but we did find other places where there were illegal campfires. Um, this is the first time I've shown this picture. So maybe uh, somebody watching will say, oh, that was my, <laughs> secret spot. Well, I hope not. But, um, but uh, with it laid bare, there was just so much to find. We were mostly looking at old ranch sites, looking for dumps and looking for um, uh, foundations and places where there might be uh, possibilities for looting later. Because, uh, you know, a lot of people like old ranch dumps. Uh, and then also the archaeological sites that had been noted around the area. Another view of Inverness Ridge, pretty much cooked, and yet a lot of areas that uh, survived. I think this is Muddy Hollow area. And this is what it was like then. This is what it'll be like up on the Woodward Fire. You're just crunching around in charcoal, 
charcoal, grass, and brush, and, and wood. Uh, some of the people, this was, this was very rewarding time in a way of that it was exciting. Uh, it was a new kind of work. I'd always wanted to be a, a fireman when I was a kid, didn't everybody? Uh, and so I uh, finally got to do something in a fire, although it was following the firefighters and not actually fighting. But um, this is uh, Bruce Farnsworth taking the photo. And he was a Park Service photographer and he took beautiful photos of this. We should be showing those. And in fact, <laughs> if, if Bruce is, a, is around, I don't know where he is, but uh, his photographs uh, are probably on file at the park and, and would, um, would make a very interesting show because they were super high quality. Mine pale in comparison. And these pictures, I brought along a camera and took pictures myself and the official pictures I took are filed at the park. But um, so in the middle, in the middle with the fire shirt is Paul Gleason, who was the official cultural resources guy on the bear team. And then on the left is Lanny Panola. And many of us knew Lanny. He was the Coast Miwok Pomo interpreter at Point Reyes National Seashore, uh, a wonderful man. Uh, he knew all the rituals uh, of the native peoples of the area. He had a great amount to do with the functions at Cooley Loclo and interpreting Native American history at Point Reyes. And he was just a wonderful guy. And I'd known him for quite some years because we worked together in the, in the same uh, department same division at the park in interpretation, but, but you know, we were both doing our own different things and different uh, 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 disciplines and eras of time. Uh, so we got to know each other, but not that well. So this was great. I got to spend two weeks with Lanny uh, going out in trucks and looking at places and having uh, a really good time with him. He, um, he's not with us anymore, but he, what a great guy. Uh, he was able to find things that you wouldn't know. It was as if he just had a sixth sense and, and would know where a, for instance, he just reached down once without even looking and pulled up a, a spear point that I think no one else would have really noticed unless they had their nose to the ground and really were looking. And here he is up on Inverness Ridge. We were walking around and following the, uh, the fire trucks and he noticed uh, some elderberry uh, plants, trees, bushes, and he noticed that there was a perfect piece to make a uh, clapper stick that is used in Coast Miwok rituals. And he brought along a saw. Uh, he, was, he was prepared and he cut off the piece and in front of me there, he sat for maybe an hour and made this clapper stick. Uh, I wish I had a picture of him with the finished project. It, 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 was, it was a really, um, really beautiful moment uh, to spend with him. Now going out to the coast, remember it burned down to the edge as did part of the Woodward fire. And so you went down, this is the coast trail heading out towards coast camp, looking out from the ridge above Limantour. You can see how it, in the center there, it, it, it bared uh, old roads and paths and things like that. It was a really interesting time to be there because you could, you could go almost anywhere you wanted. Um, but it did burn right down dramatically to the edge of the beach, just like that. I had one story that uh, I don't have pictures of because they were official and, and I'm not sure if it was appropriate. I, I wasn't really sure to take these pictures, but uh, for about four days, I was assigned a crew of convicts who were working in the rehabilitation end of it. Uh, they had their trucks and I would lead them in my little pickup truck out to various areas where work needed to be done, uh, maybe covering up a cultural site or, um, or cleaning up debris or this or that. And it was a really great experience because uh, these guys were, were, were really happy to be out and doing something. They had been in prison uh, they had to go back. Uh, and the most memorable time was when we were working at Coast Camp. Uh, and there they were at the beach. And somebody pulled out a football. And they spent an hour. We weren't really uh, strict about hours and timing and this and that. They pulled out a football. And these guys had a wonderful time, at least a good hour, of just playing on the beach, 
and really feeling a sense of freedom. And at the same time, they were contributing a great amount to the, uh, to the effort of rehabilitation uh, here at Point Reyes National Seashore. Here's an area down uh, towards Bear Valley, uh, Kellum Beach, where you can see where the fire came down in the foreground and, and hadn't burned beyond. That's double point in the far uh, distance. But notice it's burned right down to the wetlands. This is near Coast Camp. Uh, and sometimes even burned right into the wetlands and, and burned the, uh, the, the uh, wet vegetation that was down in there. You could just get a sense of how hot it was and how, how fast it was moving. The sand dunes weren't spared. It went out Limontour Spit, as you'll see in a photo coming up. Right down to the edge. So, uh, Pretty dramatic, I, I always thought. Not only cultural resources, but we visited some park sites. This is Coast Camp and the remains of a picnic table with Lanny looking on. That's what a picnic table looks like after a forest fire. And here's Daryl Klein, who was on the maintenance staff. Uh, he was one of the good characters. Uh, a lot of the fun people on the park staff were the maintenance guys. And Daryl uh, had a really great sense of humor and this and that. And so he was, his job would be to fix the infrastructure in these damaged campground areas and other places in the park. The bridge crossing Santa Maria Creek, just south of Coast Camp, was a wreck, had to be rebuilt. And Santa Maria Creek was uh, part of the Woodward fire, but I don't know if it got right down to this location. And one of the <laughs> sad things in a different way that we discovered, because we talked about we were looking for old dumps and things, well, there were some new dumps too. The big parking lot at Limantour was surrounded by brush. And after the fire came through, most of the brush was burned and it was laid bare. And lo and behold, all through the brush were bottles and cans and trash and garbage. And you could see that people had, from their, par their parked car or they got out or they were coming back, they just threw their garbage over into the brush. And that was really disheartening. This, this picture doesn't even show the extent of it because that's a big parking lot. There were places that were more dense with garbage than this. It was a terrible scene. Uh, so, the park volunteer, one of our most dedicated volunteers, Don Gunn, we called him Mr. Gunn, uh, was very interested in the history. He spent, we spent a lot of time together. Uh, uh, he'd have interesting questions to ask and then he would also come up with, very, with, with answers for things that we didn't know about. He, he published a few unauthorized books on Point Reyes National Seashore. And even though he was a beloved volunteer, he was kind of breaking the rules there, showing you how to get to places where you maybe weren't encouraged to go. Uh, there, those, those two books are kind of hard to find. They're called More to the Point. But anyway, bless his heart, he volunteered to be the one to clean up all of this stuff. And he filled bags and bags, probably a dumpster full of garbage from the Limantour Beach parking lot. Now, we've heard a lot about this in the Woodward fire that there are dozer lines uh, used to stop the fire. And they do a little bit of damage. Sometimes they can be alarming. We, don't, we haven't been able to see what's gone on in the Woodward area yet, but um, uh, these were necessary activities to stop the fire or to build a break to do a backfire. This is down by the home ranch. Um, when we went up to Mount Wittenberg, uh, to coast camp. This is the scene up there. It came up up the hills from below the camp, from west of the camp, and did a lot of burning, but you can see it didn't burn everything. Burned part of the camp. It singed the big eucalyptus tree by the spring. And I'm going to throw in the old photo here of the ranch that used to be there. It's a very similar vantage point. This is the Z, Z ranch, the last letter of the alphabet. Uh, a little dairy up on the top, and you can see how open the slopes are. If I go back, uh, uh, trees have really grown in since the 
ranching era and ended, but they didn't uh, burn too badly up there. This was one of the edges of the fire. Um, so you can see it was mostly grass being burned and some of this was backfiring, but you can see the dozer line on the left. You can see a lot of equipment down below in the lower right, because uh, there was still a lot of work to do here uh, to keep the fire from flaring up. And so it looks like a lot of damage, but all of this heals. And also part of the rehabilitation that the bear team was looking at was how to rehabilitate the, uh, uh, the work done by the dozers. And uh, so, so the, a lot of this, it was a little alarming to see, but as this has all healed quite well, here's the top of Mount Wittenberg or near the top. Uh, and this all got smoothed out. And in fact, uh, what had been a bare mountaintop for centuries, uh, and a lot of us remember going to the top of Mount Wittenberg and you had an almost 360 degree view. Well, after the fire, tons of teeny little Douglas firs popped up. And so now the summit is, uh, is a forest. And I don't know how it fared. I understand it didn't burn in the fire or perhaps parts of it did in the Woodward fire. But so this was kind of the end of that view down the Olima Valley from the top of Mount Wittenberg. These huge excavators were brought in, and this was largely to rehabilitate areas and to take out old roads. It was a it was a great opportunity. The superintendent Don Neubacher um, was able to amass a huge number of, of new staff and uh, funding for dealing with the fire for rehabilitation, and uh, so he took the opportunity to do a number of good things like uh, uh, bury power lines and phone lines that went down to Limantour Beach. Uh, and the, the power lines that went from the Limantour Road over to the home ranch were um, made underground. And using an excavator like this, they took out, they basically restored back to the way it was, a new road that had been blazed through right before the park purchase, uh, a big wide two lane road that had been built from Muddy Hollow uh, over towards the home ranch. And so uh, that was uh, taken care of and the, tra the trail was rerouted into Glenbrook Canyon. And uh, uh, so, so a whole lot of work happened after the fire was out, uh, but based on funding and uh, interest from the burning of the fire, from, from the damage from the fire. Uh, being on the bear team was really fun because I got to meet a lot of people from all over the country uh, and they leaned on me for my knowledge and things that I'd written. Uh, this ranching on the Point Reyes Peninsula uh, was the big book on the history of the ranches and, and this it had maps in it and people were able to know where they were and what was going on in these places. And uh, so these groups get together for a couple of weeks. This was about 14 days of solid work without a day off. Uh, and then they disband and they go to another fire or the season's over and they'll go back to their jobs. And then when the fire season comes again, another bear team will be uh, put together. But it was really nice. They, they signed my ranching book and uh, uh, the, each, bear had a, each bear team member had a nickname like Veggie Bear and uh, Rocky Bear was the geologist. Um, my associate Paul Gleason was called Dump Bear because his job was looking for old dumps. So uh, it was a really uh, nice time. It was a really interesting time. Uh, again, there were tragedy about it, um, but we, um, we just went out and did our job. And the park did quite a few publications while the fire was burning, keeping people updated on what was going on. And after talking about the rehabilitation uh, and this, uh, this one on the left is one that was put out a year later talking about how, how well things were healing uh, and, and how the rehabilitation work was going. So uh, just, just quite, a, quite an experience. And, and you can see that this fire was much more destructive and quite a bit larger than our current uh, Woodward fire. But um, that's not to downplay the Woodward fire, but it just, uh, this was 25 years ago, quite a, quite a time. Uh, this is a map that the park put out showing the burned area. 
with the color coding, uh, uh, a little better view of what I had showed you, the black and white version of how the fire advanced, the red part being the first day, and then the orange sweeping down to the uh, coast, and then slowly going over to the east, southeast in the Doug fir forest. So finally, the last few was the most thrilling part of my time on the bear team was that the Park Service hired helicopters as a way to evaluate the progress of the fire and then to help with the rehabilitation efforts by being able to go and look from the air at what was going on at the vegetation or, or whatever uh, uh, the particular discipline was needed. And so on an afternoon, I was invited to go up in the helicopter to look for cultural resources from the air. I'd only been in a helicopter once before, and that was a thrill. That was in San Francisco, making a film and leaning out, actually literally hanging out the door of the um, helicopter, wide open door with a video camera on a steady cam and going all over San Francisco and through the buildings under the Golden Gate Bridge. That was illegal and terrifying. But um, so heli helicopters are pretty cool. And, got to go up on this beautiful evening uh, and see sites that you usually don't see. This is just, just after we took off. That's the McFadden Ranch on Highway 1 between Point Reyes Station and Olima. You don't see it from the highway. So this was kind of a rare view with Black Mountain in the back. You can see it's a beautiful day. The fire was mostly out by now. And looking up the bay, uh, the uh, Giacomini Ranch, which was of course, uh, the uh, successful Giacomini wetlands project. So it looks quite different today. And then we flew over the ridge to have a look. This is the ignition point of the fire, the summit of Mount Vision. And uh, so we flew over just to have a look. You can see a dozer line, although that of course was after the fact because this place burned like you couldn't believe on the first 24 hours but Tamales Bay, and you can see how close the fire came. If, if the wind had changed direction and come down into Inverness, we would have had an even more terrible loss of homes. Flying around the uh, hostel area was very interesting because there, there were lots of roads and, and, and disturbances there. There had been an army camp at the Laguna Ranch during World War II. And so here I saw a, a natural geological formation, but part of which had been made into a road, the lower part. Uh, and I just spent a lot of time hiking up in this area because I knew that it was an army camp and found uh, machine gun nests, you know, these holes dug and then totally surrounded with hundreds and hundreds of machine gun shells. Uh, I found this weird square hole that was about 12, 15 feet deep, probably 12 or 15 feet square, perfectly cut into a hilltop above where the hostel is now and could never figure out what was in it, what, what it was built for. There was no way to get in and out. I wondered if it was some sort of secret uh, communication facility or, or something that, you know, uh, it just seems kind of secretive. Uh, but um, all the little old roads going up, which are now impassable because the, everything grew back so well that the old roads that we used to hike up that the army had put in or the ranchers at the Laguna Ranch, uh, or they're just, they're, you just can't get in there anymore. So, so there were some, some benefits to laying it bare in that you could see a lot and you could see, look there, you could see little landslides and this and that that were probably covered mostly by vegetation. Uh, but we flew down the coast and again, you could see the uh, fire coming to the edge. This is looking straight down. This will make you a little vert vertigonous, vertiginous, whatever you say. Uh, that's the big eucalyptus tree at Coast Camp. And you can see the fire came right around it and singed it, but it's still, it's still there. Marked the site of the U Ranch, the letter U, where the Campili, Campili family was for a whole generation back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And just some scenic views of the fire and the not fire, that's Kellum Beach in the background. 
And this is one of the more dramatic ones because notice how the fire just came whipping right out Lemontour spit. Uh, didn't stop till it reached a kind of a wet spot. Uh, and in the whole background, almost everything you see was burned in the Vision fire 25 years ago. But as far as cultural resources, most, most interesting and least expected is this area on what I call Albion Point or New Albion. Uh, this is where the Astero Trail goes. It's, it's just uh, next to Drake's, uh, uh, to Drake's head. It's the next one down towards Lemontour. You can see the spit in the background uh, in the upper right. Uh, but flowing, I could see a couple of layers of history here. One, you see a road sort of cutting through near the top of the head there. And that is the ancient old road to the schooner landing that served the steel ranch. And the steels were the pioneer dairy families who started the dairy industry basically in California, got their start at Point Reyes. This was their main home ranch where the new Albion ranch was. And uh, that was their road down to a landing that was there starting in 1857. So going back a long, long time. But then you see another layer here. You notice the stripes <laughs> along the ground. And that is the remains of one of the artichoke ranches, artichoke farms that uh, took up a lot of this land in the 1920s and 30s. Um, we grew really good artichokes here, better than the ones down in Castroville, some people said. Uh, and so there were hundreds of acres of artichokes and peas. Artichokes required these deep furrows. And here, after not having any ranching for a couple of decades and the brush covering it over when it was burned off and in the late afternoon light, you could see uh, uh, all these acres of artichoke furrows showing up. And I'm sure they're, they're hidden again now. But that was a big surprise and gave us another look at some of the history of the Point Reyes Peninsula that hadn't been very well known until, uh, until then. And then here is the Murphy Ranch, the historic after home ranch that was started in 1857. And you can see the fire came right down to the edge of the place. And if this had burned, it would have been a terrible loss for the Murphy family uh, but also to history, because this is, this is the oldest extant settlement uh, on the Point Reyes Peninsula. And it's a wonderful place. It's uh, closed to the public because it's still uh, a working ranch. You can't right, walk right through it, but uh, uh, it's just uh, an incredible area. And there's talk of building a trail, public trail has just been released that would go through the area, but not right through the ranch proper. So. Um, that was quite a dramatic scene. So I'm going to close just with a piece of art that my mother did. Uh, many of you knew her. She lived in Sea Haven for 20, almost 25 years. She was an artist. And this was her homage to the vision fire. It's very small. It's only about five inches square, five or six inches square. And uh, we love this piece. And this was her reaction. And I wanted to throw that in. Uh, our dear mother uh, with her broken mirrors and pastels showing the horror and the beauty of the fire. So that's it. My little bit of time of getting to be a fireman, kind of, not really, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but um, having quite an adventure on the fire. And so I want to uh, thank you for watching and there might be some questions. I'll get out of the screen share here and see if Amanda is there. I am here. I can't start my video for some reason, but that's okay. I think you can hear me. Uh, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, I'm not sure why I can't start my video, but I don't see any questions right now and I only see the earlier comments. So. If anybody has any questions and we have just a few moments um, for Dewey, please go ahead and, and post them. Let's see. Oh, I see, I see oh, one oh, here. Oh, I see one here. Hi, Phil. Phil Danskin, the great land surveyor. And uh, what was the purpose of Lanny's tapper stick? It's a clapper 
C-L-A-P-P-E-R. And it's a long stick. And he, what he did was he then sliced, uh, what would you call it, horizontally into it? He sliced down into it um, like, a clo like an old fashioned clothes panel almost. And when you go far enough, and I, I, I'm sure it's different when these dr are dry, and you shake it, they clap together. Probably and, dug out the inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They might have dug out the inside. I, 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 I don't remember exactly, but, but so it was a musical instrument basically that I'm sure would have had some sort of uh, spiritual meaning in, in rituals or, or this or that. I don't, I don't really know. I, I don't follow that. But it was a, a really neat thing to watch him do that. So, uh, yeah. Thanks, Phil, for that, uh, for that question. I miss you. We're, we work together uh, with old surveys and we've been shut down by coronavirus. I see- um, I a couple of questions about the bear team and I know that um, there was a bear team here and that uh, the Point Race Light covered it pretty well, but why don't you go ahead and take that one, Dewey? Yeah, I see Anne, uh, hi Anne has said, uh, are you going to be on the bear team for the Woodward Fire? No, I don't work for the park service anymore. Um, I've been working on contract with other parks, but uh, uh, so no, and I'm too old for it probably anyway, <laughs> uh, but thanks for that. And Matt, hi Matt, um, was the bear team an extra job that I did? Well, no, it was part of, my, part of my hours, although they were long hours. It was, like I said, it was about 14 days nonstop of long, long days. I'm really glad Carrie came home uh, <laughs> because uh, with three kids, Three young kids in school who are just starting school. We, we, uh, I needed some help. Uh, so, um, but it was an ex. It was it was a completely different assignment. It was an emergency assignment. So I didn't do my regular job. I just did this, and uh, it was a really good opportunity. So, so I think that. Uh, and then I see Jasper. Did they ever figure out who started the campfire? Yes, and I think that's all I can say. <laughs> no, because it was juveniles and they didn't release uh, uh, their names and it was uh, a uh, accident. Uh, it, it was an it was an accident. It was it wasn't like they were trying to start a fire. So they were treated pretty well and were uh, I'm sure they felt pretty bad about it. We will be uh, we did record this and we will figure out how to get it up online and it will be posted on the KWMR website and most likely in the roundup. Yeah. And so, um, hey Jasper, are you related to Oliver Dibble? Hmm, used to know the Dibbles and Ross. Uh, there's, uh, there's maybe a few chats here. Let me see. Oh, okay. So the wind never came from the west pushing the fire over the ridge, only only the part, it was mostly pushing it south, the part that, that uh, burned into the top of Paradise Ranch Estates and luckily didn't per push it north or any farther to the east. There is a question in the chat that says, uh, you said the Steel Ranch was the first dairy. When was it founded? It was founded in 1857. It wasn't the very first dairy people were milk milking cows, but it was the first substantial dairy and commercial dairy that uh, served San Francisco, uh, the, uh, and there, there's a lot written about it. I've written about it, and then you can also read about it in historical journals. Uh, the Steels were pioneers of dairying in, in California. They, when they left Point Reyes after about a decade from 1857 to the mid 1860s, they went down to Pescadero, and that whole area around Año Nuevo were the uh, steel ranches. I understand they lost one of the steel houses, ancient steel houses in the fire down there, what called the pie ranch. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, so it was the first substantial dairy that like I say, there were people milking a few cows, but this was the first one that was producing uh, for, the, for the market in San Francisco. And Kreta, we'll talk about that maybe if you want on the radio, because we're gonna do something on the radio. Sounds good. Uh, I don't see any other questions. If you have a question for Dewey, go ahead and type it in. We have a couple more minutes here. Uh, before we are done with our first ever. Oh, here's one. How would a schooner landing have been set up at the Steel Dairy? A long pier? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't very long from what we understand, although we don't have a picture of it. But um, 
the, uh, uh, the, these were little schooners that came in, shallow draft schooners uh, that could come in at the right tide. So I would guess that it was something similar to the pier that was in Schooner Bay uh, up near where the Oyster Company used to be, uh, that it would have been maybe 50 feet long, something like that would be able to reach out so this shallow draft schooner could come in. And there were quite a few in Drake's Estero. There were something like four or five uh, little piers in Drake's Estero. And then- Were they very tide dependent, Dewey? Would be, they have to really plan their trips based on the tides? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because getting in and out, the, um, the entrance to Drake's Estero uh, was tricky. Mm -hmm. And you needed to know your stuff uh, and you needed to time it right. Same with uh, Tamales Bay, they're, they're tricky and treacherous getting into Tamales Bay as well. All right, well, Jasper does not know Oliver. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, all right, uh, anybody have any other questions? Thank you all for um, participating this evening. And thank you so much, Dewey Livingston, for sharing your knowledge with KWMR on a monthly basis and also for doing this presentation, um, we, you are a, you are a treasure. Huh, thank you. Well, um, I wanted to mention too that uh, here at the Jack Mason Museum of West Marin History, this is you see our archives are behind us. Um, uh, we have a really good collection of information about the Vision Fire. In fact, a an oral history project that uh, that one of our volunteers did right after the fire talking to people who were involved and fought the fire, even I believe some of the convict uh, uh, workers. And uh, so we have, we have good resources here if you're interested in pursuing more uh, about that. Oh, there is another question. Were there any objects found in the culture ex excursion that discovered an object that ended up back on display anywhere in the park or the visitor center? Uh, Um, nothing that's coming to mind, uh, at least not on display. The spear point that Lanny fied, found uh, went into the collection, but I, I can't think of anything that went on display. Mostly things were burned and it a lot of what we were finding uh, so-called historical in dumps and stuff really was, was not even worth digging out. Things from the 30s and 40s and 50s. I guess if you're a bottle collector, you might disagree, but... Um, there wasn't anything noteworthy, and we were mostly making sure that things were safe. All right, well, Dewey, thank you so much. Um, as we mentioned before, this has been recorded, and we're gonna figure out how to get it out there for folks to check it out. And uh, we thank you all for attending today. Yes, thanks for coming, everybody. So I think, Dewey, since I made you the host, you have to end it all for us today. I'm going to hit end. Bye, everybody. Bye.